Hello and welcome. We're here at Holistic Investments and I'm your host, Konstantin Kogan. And I'm excited to have an uh, amazing guest today, Ken Ziwan, who's an entrepreneur and investor. He's a co-founder of Symbolic Capital and Seer Network, backed by Binance Labs. He has previously served as a vice president, general manager in Hilby Capital, uh, oh, sorry, Hilby Global, and founded uh, in a backed traction. Kenzie has invested in multiple VC funds and hundreds of projects You know, throughout his career. He's a par- he was also a partner at Boardless Capital. And, you know, just an exciting human being who's been around the block, you know, for for a lot of time to know things about crypto that you would love to learn from. So really excited to have you here, Kenzie. Thank you. Thank you, Constantine. Very good to be in the same city as you, as we both travel a lot. But, uh, you know, now we're both in New York City. So and when it's uh, you no know, beautiful out, you know, no, no smogs, no smoke uh very happy today yes and it's it's definitely good good to have a fresh air you know <laughs> for someone who didn't know you know that we had a, a lot of uh a polluted air from canada lately but now it's it's much better uh but just before we start you know that we throw traditional legal disclaimer that this content is for informational purposes only you should not construe any such information or other other material as legal tax investment financial or any other advice now we can talk about a lot of things, right? So, but let's start from the beginning, right? You have a successful career, like, you know, as a, not only as an entrepreneur, but predominantly as an investor, right? You started, you know, like I would say, as I understand more from a, um, an exchange, you know, like your path, right? You know, and then went to VC funds, you know. So can you tell a little bit about how it all started to you, the entrance to the crypto world? Yeah, totally. That's always a, a great topic. That's also usually when I start, you know, with someone, you know, my first question is, how did you get into crypto? So in my case, um, I had a, a fairly successful Web2 startup back in the day in San Francisco. And uh, we um, raised, you know, funding from some very large VCs uh, before and did Series A. And then... As soon as we finished the round, my, um, you know, one of my, my co-founders, uh, you know, tech guy actually quit. So um, that was, you know, one of the first times I, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, really intrigued into crypto because the reason why he quit was because he wanted to, uh, to join crypto. So at the time I thought, you know, this is crazy, you know, you're nuts. Uh, you know, what was the uh, year? Don't do that. And this is 2013. Yeah. Well, the first time I heard about crypto was, you know, earlier, 2011, 12. But I just discarded, you know, I just thought that, oh, you know, it's never going to get big. No crypto. It's just anti-government, you know. Uh, you know, it's going to get, even if it gets somewhat, you know, a moderately successful, you know, I just thought that, you know, government's going to come in and just crack down. Uh, so I really didn't think it's going to become a thing. Um, also, you know, back then in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, you know, it, it was, you know, it's kind of got this, you know, um, image of, uh, you know, it's not like totally legit in, in some of these, you know, you know, earlier techies, like, you know, the, my circle, right. It's not seen as totally like, you know, good to, to, uh, to, to associate with, um, but then, you know, back to, you know, 2013, uh, whereas, you know, my, uh, um, you know, lead, lead tech person, you know, he actually, you know, went to uh, uh, join crypto. Uh, and I, I told him, hey, you know, here, take some t- take some money as, you know, severance, whatnot, and then uh, uh, come back in a year and go travel the world, do whatever you want to do. Um, so he did. And then, uh, um, and then fast forward a few years, he turned the uh the severance into something crazy like 40x right you know yeah i don't want to review the numbers but that's you know some you know crazy uh life-changing capital that he uh you know turned just by investing in uh, in bitcoin and also in ethereum so in 2016 after i exited from my startup i was looking and i started to you know um look into this bit more and also reconnect it with, you know, my uh, uh, previous co-founder and uh, um, seeing his success, which at the time 
I felt like, oh, I need to get into this now. So um, I'm very, you know, fortunately, one of my um, very good friends, uh, he is one of the, uh, actually one of the very big miners in, uh, in, in China at the time, Bitcoin miner. And he, he's a um, very good friend with the CEO back then, uh, the founder and CEO of Poebi Global, uh, Leon. So um, he introduced me to uh, uh, the uh, Leon at the time. And then quickly that just, you know, fast forward me uh, getting a position, a pretty high position there uh, very quickly. And that's how I got into, you know, you know, my 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 first rodeo essentially uh, into crypto at the time. And that's also, uh, you know, 2016, that's the heyday of uh Hobby as an exchange, you know, this is before Binance was a thing. And, um, you know, being at an exchange, you really get to see um, everything. Because for me, I also wanted to play catch up because I mm-hmm. wasn't like, you know, you know, back then, I, I really never thought of myself as an OG right now. I talk to people, oh, you know, when did you join? I say 2016. They're like, oh, you're OG. But back then, I really didn't think I was that OG. I actually thought I was, you know, very behind. So I actually wanted to um, learn as fast as possible. So being a hobby, working on exchange operations and also corp dev, some of these listings, you know, of these, you know, projects really was, you know, the best experience I could have, you know, as an entry into uh, the space because, um, you know, exchange is... uh, you know, at the top of the food chain at the time. And you really get to see, you know, across the board, um, all the pro- top projects and all of the uh, the market makers and all the VC funds. So it's a, it's a, it's a very quick, you know, crash course and boot camp on learning, you know, everything associated with the industry in general, which, you know, also, um, you know, really trained me on how to evaluate, you know, crypto projects and help me form the foundation of, uh, you know, investing into, you know, early stage protocols. And uh, so that's, that's, you know, long story TLDR of how I got into crypto. Now, now that's an interesting topic that we can go, go into. How would you uh, differentiate one of the top three, I would say, things that you compared to yourself when you were wearing a hat as a like you know person who was uh, you were an enlisting team technically right is if, if i recall correctly so my main job was uh exchange operations so okay. that's actually the you know the 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 core bread and butter business of exchange so mm-hmm. that includes um uh, everything from you know, running uh, promotions for projects, evaluate projects for listing, as mm-hmm. well as you know, making sure there's enough volume, and uh, um, you know, all the all the unglamorous you know stuff that's happening with an exchange, yeah. and that's the core uh, core core business of the exchange. And certainly, listing was a, a part of you know part the of uh, rodeo as well. So, so here is the question. So basically, I think it will be interesting to see your outlook as a person who is wearing a hat, uh, uh, evaluating the project for listing at an exchange, which was pretty big at that time, right? You're one of the top. And now as a VC, what are the main differences, how you look at the project from back then and now? Um, is, is this more for listing purposes or for investment purposes? Because that there's a difference. So the question is, is for investing projects, but different time frame, right? Yes. Or is it for listing projects, but different? Let, 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 let's talk about the listing versus investment. Because I know that every exchange, actually, if they really like a project, they also have an investment arm, right? You know, I know Hobie had, had back in the day, it's also Hobie Ventures, right? And every big exchange, they have their venture arm. So, you know, so there, there can be a combination of both um yeah that's a very complicated topic i'll try to cover uh, a certain you know uh part of it so you know exchange listing you know the main things that you look for um whether it's back then or now the first thing that you think about would be you know how many users you can attract 
by mm -hmm. listing this new project. So that um, certainly, you know, is there's a positive correlation of that volume or users you can get by listing the good projects and also investing in a, a you know a good you know company there is you know certain correlation you no know, but it's not always exact same type of uh, evaluation you know for for example you know binance uh you know listed you know some of these social coins right football clubs right you know i think with that um the really goal there is to attract you know these fans the fan clubs you know, of of uh, of let's say you know a Barcelona or a Man U, these you know soccer teams, right? They want to get more more users. Mm -hmm. So um, you know back then, you know Hobi was a leader in the exchange space, um, and you know certainly the the focus at that time was you know to uh, land grab user base, um, and the uh, um, um, you know. That's still the same now, but I think the the listing frequency is uh, is is uh, is a lot a lot less now because overall, uh, you know, we're talking about back then, you know, 2016, 17. That's you know, there's a lot of volume for for listing projects, but now, um, you know, it's uh, it's it's we're kind of you know in this uh, you know deep uh, bear market. So um, the the timing is is a bit different back then, you know there were not that many projects exactly. and the volume was, it was insane you know back then you know um the um the 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 amount of uh good projects really is the supply and demand is very opposite of now like back then almost every project gets listed the volume and also the price go through the roof and uh um um so whatever hobby was listing back then it you know it's uh it, it produced tremendous uh, amount of volume uh you know no matter what but now in this at this time there are a lot of projects out there um but you know the uh in terms of volume wise it, it's not uh as substantial as 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 uh as you know the in terms of proportion wise as as before so you know back then um the the founders have uh you know a good project founders you know because there's not that many right have a lot of you know uh you know uh power because uh because there's just not that many projects out there but now it's more of an exchange driven market so your bargaining power of a, you know against an exchange you know is is not not as uh yeah. not as great as before it's like supply but, demand uh, basically yes yeah but, yeah because back I, then it's just you know the founders you can command you know uh, no listing fees and uh, you mm -hmm. can get very pre preferential treatments but now um we're also at a very interesting time where there you know are very few exchanges that have high volumes, but uh, but but because of that, these exchanges have super strong bargain power, nice. and they can essentially command whatever term uh, they you know they want, and the founder would just have to agree. There's not much of a oh let me give you a counter offer, you know. There's no such you know thing. Well, uh, well there, there is there is alternative strategy with few projects that actually drive uh, organic traffic and they they list on DEXs. It's it's an exception, so I would say it's a radical exception, not popular at all. However, we've seen that those projects actually exist, right? You know, so so I think you know somehow like you know they're like hopefully like in the future the DEXs will also become even maybe more popular, even though they're not right now in reality and yeah you're right so the biggest central exchanges are controlling like because of this a lot now my question to you is probably like you know short short version just to conclude this exchange topic like you know what do you think is going to happen in the future as a trend with central exchanges do you think there will be more players who will conquer the the, the market share of the exchanges that actually went out of the business right 
or how would it be split in the future? Well, I feel like with all the you know regulatory um, activity that's going on uh, right now, um, I just feel like you know a few things needs to happen. Uh, number one is I feel like some of these big players, you know, um, for example, Binance and also you know OK. Um, some of these top exchanges, you know, maybe especially Binance, it, it would be good for them to uh, um, to also have, um, you know, more competitors, you know, because more competition, it would also uh, reduce the, uh, um, the risk of, let's say, one or two of these exchanges get, you know, taken down. Um, it will uh, drastically... Uh, you know, uh, produce a shockwave across the industry. Like, you know, let's say, you know, something happens with Binance or CZ, you know, uh, in the foreseeable future, I, I could not help but think that it's going to uh, potentially push us into some kind of a, a crypto winter, right? I think that's, you know, a, a I mean, very that's bad. already happening. You can see even the, all the news from the United States that they're pushing. Well, you know, we're not there yet. We have, you know, this, you know, so you have TC, SCC. These are civil, right? You know, we haven't yeah. really seen the DOJ. You know, there could be other stuff that, you know, are uh, a bit more serious than, you know, these initial attempts, right? So uh, one is, uh, you know, de-risking by having more competitors, more sexist competitors, you know, uh, to, you know, as it also, uh, you know, ha help produce more of a uh, competition amongst themselves and also uh, a uh, more less leverage from the exchange side, right? So because mm -hmm. more competition that will also reduce what I just talked about, you know, in the first question is, you know, now the founders really have no leverage. But if you have a few exchanges, you know, more exchanges, then, you know, the founders, you know, now there's more of a, a bidding, you know, so then you have more options to go with and it would not have a, a mo you know, a, a monopoly type of setting where founders have really have no bargaining power when it comes to a, uh, a listing package. And thirdly is that, you know, these, you know, exchanges, um, when they are, are more exchanges, then there's more, also more voices. And that lobbying power together will be much greater than, let's just say, there's only Coinbase and the Binance. They're lobbying. You know, um, if there are 20, you know, and 20 exchanges are lobbying, you know, the uh, regulators and also the political uh, kind of landscape, I think that would also produce more of a, uh, a unified power in this industry. Um, so I think that that needs to happen. Um, and also, you know, I think more DEXs should also happen with more volume. Um, but DEXs right now, it has, you know, the user experience problem, right? You know, it just doesn't really feel as, as a, uh, you know, the volume is, 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 you know, have that, you know, sex experience. It's kind of the holy grail. All the DEXs, you know, they want to have offer a sex experience and also sex level security. Um, will take some time, but I think as tech gets better, um, also there will be more, you know, uh, DEXs that would get more market share. So that, that also needs to happen. Okay, so let's 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 now ask you a different question. You were in or more a VC head, right? Let's imagine you have two pitch decks, right? You know, like of the project Z that like raising for centralized exchange and DEX, right? You know, what would be the the top three criteria that will be actually really attractive for you for you to actually pay attention and to potentially invest in a next Binance of the world or next Uniswap of the world? Well, I think number one thing um, would be their, you know, underlying technology, whether it's going to be, you know, offering something that's, you know, just so much better in terms of a user experience, right? You know, uh, attracting liquidity and also the UI, UX, the product, you know, um, you know, it, how, how can they provide a much smoother onboarding and also trading experiences than uh, uh, existing 
sex and also uh, taxes. That's number one. And who's behind it? I think who operates these exchanges is also really, really important. Often overlooked because um, most people don't understand how operationally intensive an exchange business is. And if it's just a pure tech team that, you know, has the, um, you know, the um, building tech part of the knowledge, but not so much on the operational, you know, the um, that kind of know-how, and you may end up producing something like a, a, a FTX, right? You know, they're just, you can just see that, you know, this, this, yeah, you know, certainly there's, you know, some tech is there. I really like the, the perb trading, you know, some of these, uh, you know, um, derivative, you know, trading experience because they're traders, you know, and also they build tech, but they don't have, you know, that type of operational excellence, you know, that also kind of spills over to their, you know, their tracking of their books and also, you know, some of these, you know, operational finances side risk of things. Management. And that creates, yeah, risk management that creates long-term problems, right? Um, so that's often overlooked is the operational uh, de-risking, whoever you have on your team, they should be excellent, you know, on the operation side. You know, I, I'd say one of the, the reasons why Huobi was so successful back in the day, and I was very, very, very impressed. Went to the Beijing office, my first week, you know, working there, you know, went through this, you know, uh, boot camp of onboarding into uh, the the hobby, um, you know, the uh, the the workflow there, and I was just blown away by the operational excellence that they had, and also that's one of the main reasons why they were, you know, the the Binance before Binance. You know, they just had, you know, so much understanding of how to make an exchange successful on the operational level. So I think that is something I would look for, you know, having worked at an exchange before, I know that's very difficult, very hard to get right. And, uh, uh, you know, third thing I would look for, you know, would be, you know, the, uh, um, you know, in terms of security, I think security is also very, uh, very, very important uh, for the obvious reasons, right? You know, um, account extractions and also securities, you know, this type of things, would be um, a necessary, um, you know, type of, you know, uh, a must for next generation of mm -hmm. sex and also taxes, you know. So uh, I will be looking for those those uh, um, those features um, that enables their accounts and you know crypto holdings to be secure and also accessing you know crypto wallets uh, to be easy, you know, through account abstractions, these type of uh, uh, now, you know, features. Now imagine you have three of those components already, like, you know, com like they're, they're already there, they're complete. And you have those opportunities, it, identical, like, you know, in terms of allegation, in terms of amazing team security, like, you know, I don't know, matchmaking engine, like everything, but you still have like a short answer, right? You have a centralized exchange and a decentralized exchange. Which one? Which of? But you can invest only one million in one deal. You cannot invest in two. Which one would you choose? You know that depends on the level of technology. I feel, um, and also it's never the same. You know, so it's really hard. You know, when you say it's exactly the same, it's, it cannot be the same because you know the sex and Dex have different technology stack, right? Of course. No, I imagine. Um, imagine that, that what I'm saying. Like, imagine the criteria that that the both tech are good, right? You know, both teams have their own, like, you know, like I would say, advanced, like, you know, features in decentralized, you know, like experience, and then in centralized. But, uh, but like, it's more about the question is about your conviction. Do you still like more bullish on centralized exchanges? And it's an honest answer, right? Or you're still, or you actually are more bullish on decentralized exchanges as a future. Yeah, honestly, right now I will be leaning towards investing in DEXs for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one is investing in sexes, it's extremely operational intensive. And I just feel like there's going to be so much money that needs to be plowed into it. And uh, on top of that, you know, this user acquisition cost is also very high. You know, competing sex versus sex is is like um very difficult and i've played that game before you know 
at Huobi acquiring users. And I almost feel like it's just impossible now to come in with a new sex to compete against in an existing uh, com- you know, incumbents like Binance, who has awesome products, awesome volume, awesome distribution. And uh, they, you know, it's just, it's, it's nearly, it's very, I wouldn't say impossible, but very difficult to compete. You know, I, I think FTX did a great job at, you know, carving out a piece for themselves by having their own niche. Um, I think in certain, you know, buckets, you know, there may be opportunities. Maybe let's say you're very, very good at um, derivative. You know, I think last year, this new exchange, BitGet, was able to get a lot of volume on, you know, mm-hmm. this uh, derivative side of things. Maybe you're very good at, you know, you know, options, you know. So there are buckets of like specialty areas you can come in and compete uh, as a sex. But in general, it's so hard. It requires so much funding. Um, Dex, a bit different because Dex, you don't need that much of customer support and all of that, you know, sex, you know, operation stuff. You can, you know, have a leaner team and, um, you know, you can, you can be more capital efficient, but, Mm -hmm. you know, the core of this is you also have to have differentiated tax because there's so many DEXs out there. Both are very, very hard, but I feel like in terms of capital efficiency, and just concentration and focus, you know, if you, I think DEX wise, it's probably a little bit easier to carve out a piece for yourself. So if we're like on topic of DEXs, right, you know, so each chain, they have their own like, you know, prime DEXs, right? You know, so Ethereum has Uniswap, you know, like BNB chain has, you know, PancakeSwap, Polygon has QuickSwap. So so if you were to predict the future of DEXs, like since you're more bullish in it right now, what do you think is going to be like, is this going to be multi-chain? You know, how how do you foresee that like, you know, one chain is somehow going to outperform others? Like, just want to have your opinion on that as well. Definitely multi-chain. Um, you know, definitely multi-chain. There may be some special chains, but, you know, a multi-chain where, you know, user experience is, you know, prioritized you know um that would be the kind of future um that i see Mm -hmm. you know um you know some you know new decks that can really you know and you know offer a sex like user experience you know will be um will will have an easier time uh, on competing got it Okay, so that concludes this part. So now coming back to symbolic capital, right? You know, so you are focused, you know, it's a VC fund, right? You're focused on early stage, you know, seed and I guess up to series A. Uh, Tell us a little bit more. What's the range? What's the check size? You know, what are the main criteria you're looking at besides, you know, we talked about exchanges, right? But I'm sure you have a wide range of, you know, DeFi products that you're looking at infrastructure. So tell us a little bit more on this side. Yeah, so we're, you know, a thesis, you know, driven fund that's very um, heavily leaning into the the team's quality. So we're very, you know, a founder um, focus, you know, because we're, um, Sandeep and I were um, Web3 founders first ourselves and having gone through um, the rodeo of, you know, uh, transitioning from Web2 to Web3 and founding our own you know, Web3 uh, projects and then, you know, taking it uh, to the next level. Having learned a lot, we really want to also, uh, you know, help the next generation of Web3 founders on building something big. So uh, we like to write checks in the range of 500K to $2 million Mm -hmm. um, as our first check. And then we can also you know, add more uh, later on if they need more capitals or raising further rounds. But that will be the setup that we like to take a lead position uh, on formulated rounds and bring um, ecosystem partners and also other, you know, strategic VCs in our network uh, to help founders. And along the way, also provide all sorts of support and ourselves make available 
you know, to help with uh, founders and also sharing our experience, um, you know, of, of learning and, uh, and to, to really give them this, uh, um, you know, a, a shortcut, right? Because without knowing, you know, some of these Web3 concepts, you know, building communities, you know, talking to exchanges, talking to, you know, uh, market makers, and these are just all new concepts. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, for for new founders to succeed. Mm -hmm. No, 100%. And I think it's amazing that you're taking the lead and you prefer to do that. There's actually a few funds that I know that not only actively investing in the bear market, but also trying to take the lead. That's very admirable. Like, And I know it's not easy because that means you have to focus, laser focus on the one or two projects, right? And then like provide the full support. Which leads me to another question and maybe a short one with, do you prefer equity or tokens or a hybrid model with you know token warrants? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. You know, we definitely uh, understand the uh, um, the potential of networks. You know, having you know done uh, Web three token projects, network based projects ourselves, we see the potential of tokens. How it can you know, really quickly, you know, grow the user base and also, you know, uh, uh, kickstart a new protocols ecosystem, you know, unlocking the power of such. Um, so um, we like to get, you know, uh, investing to token projects, but at the same time, you know, we, we're we also seeing that the landscape has also shifted quite a bit. You know, back then it was mostly just SAFTs, um, so that just only offers tokens. Nowadays, we see most projects that we're investing anyways, it offers, you know, equity plus tokens. So we will get both uh, now. Mm -hmm. uh, for, but we also have uh, invested in projects that's only equity. For example, you know, in certain categories like security, um uh you know typically those companies yeah they don't, don't really expect yeah yeah they don't have tokens right you know um so then in that case we would just only uh have equity um yeah so that that's that's kind of our our strategy and also right. preference and then i will ask you more of a tricky question which i'm thinking like you know some people might have and maybe they will not uh, ask you directly, but since like we're having an honest conversation, I think it's uh, fair to ask. Sandeep is a founder of Polygon, which is one of the top, you know, like layer, you know, like protocols in the industry. So, I mean, given that you know there's a um, you know a, a, such a strong you know support from Polygon ecosystem, does it would you invest in other like projects on other chains? You know, oh my God, this is like a, um, you know, we get asked that all the time <laughs> I'm sure. and it, it's good that, you know, but we also wanted to actually, you know, this is, this is a thing, right? You know, um, so the, 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 the short, the short answer is, you know, we are not just only looking at Polygon projects. I think, you know, the fact that, you know, Sandeep has, you know, carries a lot of industrial weight and, you know, really created you know, Polygon out of nowhere. It's inspiration. That's also why, you know, I, you know, um, we became really good friends and I, you know, I, I felt like, uh, you know, he's just a very uh, inspiring, you know, guy. Um, but we got our start, you know, and the concept of uh, investing together, which lead to, which led to, uh, you know, Symbolic Capital and also the Beacon Accelerator was us investing together into all the ecosystem back then. So when Sandeep and I met at Binance Lab, this is after I, you know, uh, left uh, Hobby. Uh, we then started our own projects, uh, res you know, respectively, and we started our project at Binance Labs in uh, end of 2018, and um, that is where we then started to collaborate together because you know in a in a um, in an incubator program you you know forge very strong relationships and uh, i often just see this guy well he's always never you know leaving the office he's sleeping in the office and you know working so hard and then we started to you know just share our understanding of web3 and um i would often bring you know deals that i you know sourced and then some people do the tech diligence and he's very fast on tech diligence. 
that's kind of how we started to invest in a number of uh, projects uh, together. And that's, you know, obviously, you know, Matic at that time didn't have an ecosystem yet. So we, you know, uh, established the basis of, you know, this working relationship by investing in all the projects, uh, but placing a very founder focused diligence. You know, for us, it's really, you know, less about what chain you're building on, which ecosystem you're supporting, not even so much so as, you know, oh, what exactly are you building for us? You know, a lot of this goes into, you know, do we think that this founder, these founders and this group of people, do they possess the potential and quality that we see that can be molded into the leaders of the Web3 space? Because our, you know, sort of the diligence, you know, on the type of people that we want to work with is very different. We're not looking for the typical Web2 founder type of personality. You know, as we started to invest in, you know, people and projects, you know, together since, you know, our, you know, started this co-working relationship, we developed our own thesis on who, you know, we want to work with and who has the potential, you know, based on some of these, you know, qualities that we see that possess, you know, personalities also included as well is that we developed our own theory on how we should invest. So back then we had a investment vehicle called SKIP, uh, S-K-I-P. So it's Sandeep Kenzie Investment Program. <laughs> and through that, we invested in awesome, really awesome projects. You know, the, you know, some layer ones and layer twos, you know, like the Harmony, you know, the, uh, and, you know, the uh, um, inject, Injective and Axie Infinity, you know, a lot of really great uh, top projects. And and we also got to work with amazing people, right? So that's kind of how we got our start. And that's also the reason why we wanted to institutionalize this efforts together, you know, into more of a, you know, um, a venture firm. And that's kind of how, you know, Symbolic Capital got started. So, uh, you know, to summarize this, right? So because we have been investing in, you know, more of a founder driven type of way and not just simply based on a particular, you know, ecosystem or chain per se, we continue on with our approach. It's less so about a particular chain. So and surely, you know, if a, uh, a Portco, you know, founder want to work with Polygon, we would gladly, you know, uh, connect them with, you know, the best people within the Polygon ecosystem. But at the same time, we also have built in-house tech and also, you know, um, you know, software that can connect them to other ecosystem as well. Like we also have Near. We have, you know, um, we just talked to Treasure, which is Magic today as well. So we keep, build, keep building these uh, connections that we bring to our founders. So we, we build in-house tech where the founders can just click one button, then they get connected to all of these ecosystems, right? So um, that's that's what we wanted to enable is um, is to uh, um, enable project founders, whatever they're building, and we would help them succeed. Uh, and the doesn't short matter version, what. the short version, you're chain agnostic, right? <laughs> so, so, got it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and. So from this, like you mentioned several times already, Beacon Accelerator, right? So maybe you can talk a little bit about like how that does that work and what's uh, how do you differentiate? Let's say you have a project early stage seed or pre-seed, you know, they're coming onto you. How do you decide whether it's going to be a symbolic capital bucket investment or you're going to send them to Beacon Accelerator? Right. It's really the, uh, you know, the stage, you know, that they're in, you know, symbolic, you know, is more... You know, we like to lead rounds and write uh, a substantial, you know, uh, check, you know, into seed Series A companies. Mm -hmm. um, but last year, you know, that was, you know, when we started to look at, you know, projects, you know, in the spare market. And we see, you know, there are actually a lot of really great early stage opportunities, early stage founders, and they're not quite there yet. You know, they're just two, three people that are working on an interesting idea, have like a semi-made product, some tractions, but not they're quite there yet. You know, at the stage we have enough con conviction 
but they possess some, you know, early signs of these, you know, um, uh, the pattern matching that we developed for Web3 founders that we see that there's potential here. And also because, you know, Sandeep and I have come from that similar sort of uh, background and also, you know, um, gone through a accelerator before together. We've gone through, we've done this and also have gone through trenches together, right? So we really miss that. And we feel like, you know, uh, looking back, a lot of successful projects that we invested were that similar type of people, were similar type of, you know, people that have gone through similar experiences. So we decided to want to recreate that experience, especially now in a tough market. You know, when the market's good, yeah, you know, probably, you know, you, you know, you don't need to suffer as much, but that suffering in this bear market is actually good. We feel like, it's a really good time for us to start something with that kind of ethos is to um, build a cohort based, uh, you know, investment program for super early stage founders. You know, this is a, these are pre-seed, you know, project founders and also create that environment for them to suffer together and <laughs> learn together. Right. You know, wrestle and roll on the ground a few times and then, you know, grow up, you know, through that experience. And that's also how, you know, you know, Sandeep and I became really good friends by suffering together, right? You need that kind of little like bit of pain. You, you're talking you about to... catharsis. Yes. You know, it's basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you, you need, if everything is great, everything is happy, then you may not have really actually built that deeper bond that, you know, you know yeah. I think, I think, you know, we human, we humans, we bond based on difficult circumstances. Yes. And difficult circumstances and shared experience also builds characters. And we're seeing that magic happening now also, you know, at, you know, our Buchanan uh, Accelerator. We see that. We see the, you know, that type of, uh, you know, uh, chemistry and uh, that shared uh, experience is really creating some really wonderful things for founders, you know, and we want them to become, you know, lifelong friends. Uh, and I think that goes beyond just uh, simply investing, right? You know, for us, you know, because we're more of a founder mentality ourselves. Uh, so we, we really miss that. We really also want to just, you know, see more people become, you know, like like us that can... Uh, um, build bonds. You know, yeah, build bonds. And, you know, this would be it's beyond just simply building some tech. Right. This is yes. also more you can take with you. You can take the bonds with you. Like I can go back to, you know, some of these people that we worked with before through the accelerators. We're still very good friends. We yeah. we always looking back, thinking that oh, these are really fond memories, and this really goes. You know, that's that's also why people go to colleges, right? You you know, you make friends, and these are some of them become lifelong friends because you you know you have shared experience together. Yes. So let me ask you, how long is the program and like, you know, what do the people actually get, you know, from this program? Do they have an investment, you know, and some support and mentoring, like, you know, or can you elaborate a little bit on that? Totally. So the programs are three months long and uh, we do invest. We invest 250K per project at a very decent uh, standard term. Um and, um, you know, through that, we then, you know, have cohort based learning programs. And uh, we also bring our network of mentors. Right now, we have over 15 mentors, and these range from top tier VCs at big VC firms and also top tier founders, you know, from you know, all the major protocols. And uh, they will come in and offer lectures to our founders or workshops. Um, there are ways for our founders to get in touch with them directly, you know, for, uh, you know, building, partnering, learning together. And we also have a uh, um, preferred vendor and ecosystems that we bring in, you know, to our founders, you know, for them to save costs. For example, you know, the AWS, you know, the Google, so they can save a lot of money by enrolling and working with our preferred vendors, and also ecosystem they can use to work with, you know, uh, all of these, you know, ecosystem out there. Uh, there are ways for them to directly get in touch. And uh, does it have to then, be physical or it can be virtual also? 
You know, the Web3 ethos and also, you know, post-COVID has really become, you know, remote. And uh, we have founders from, uh, you know, covers everywhere in the world. You know, we, we definitely also want to curious some um, in-person experience as well, but we feel like the best way is just, you know, to offer them and have them meet at conferences for now. But, you know, for the large part, the programs are uh, remote first. Um, and then this program, you know, culminates uh, on a, a demo day, which is where we also, you know, showcase to our wide network. We have, you know, 500 investors now in network that will come and uh, um, where our founders will present, you know, their uh, short pitches to those investors uh, in a very, in a very concise and also in a very, very, very uh, uh, orderly way uh, to showcase their projects, right? So that that's sort of the the main core um, value. We took a lot of inspirations from some of the other top accelerators that we were part of and uh, put that together. And really made it very web, very very web three. I think the 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 core programming is really focused on making you know uh, web two founders more web three native or you know web three founders you know more experienced. You know, so mm-hmm. that's that's kind of the ethos. We teach a lot of stuff that you cannot you know learn you know uh, anywhere else because these are taught by you know web three leaders. They will teach you some of the core stuff that. You can learn anywhere because our core uh, philosophy here is that Web3, it's a very different sport. You know, we think, let's say Web2 is a uh, sprinting, you know, then Web3 would be like skiing. So it's very counterintuitive. You know, these are very different sports, but I think largely the general population out there, the general, you know, tech community out there have not really, uh, for the most part, realized that yet. I think they're still bucketing this to be the same beasts. Yes. They're still thinking, oh, if you are a very good, you no know, Google uh, person, very good, you know, guy from Dropbox, you're going to be able to go build this next generation of Uniswap. You know, it doesn't really work that way. You know, these are very, very different skill sets. That's the same thing as what you asked me before. Oh, you know, this sex and this Dex. you know, if you have this, this kind of people there, do you think they can be successful? No, I think it's very different. I think the sex people probably won't be able to build great DEXs. Same thing, DEX people won't be able to build great sexes. Yes, and it's a, it's a good point. So, so yeah, especially it's very hard to ski when the ice is cracking under your feet sometimes due to regulations. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, right now, I yeah, right now it's very hard to ski. Right now the snow, yeah, I mean, yeah. Right now there's just cracks everywhere. And uh, your your ski gear is also all broken up. Correct. So it's very very. Hard. So so what are you what are you? I'm sure you're looking at thousands of projects, right? You know. So what are you actually bullish on? Is there like again like some of the top examples of you know like some of the firms will say, well, you know what, we're still thinking there is a huge opportunity in whatever zk rollups or dexes as you mentioned, or maybe some other link infrastructure like you know cybersecurity. So is there something that you would identify as like really like something very hot that is like the industry actually needs and you would be excited to see the teams who deliver this particular product or you're still like agnostic towards the 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 founders and they have to solve problem and become best at what they do and that's that's the bottom line yeah we see a ton of deals and we also have you know, over time you know grown you know seeing the past cycles we try not to look at some of these me too concepts you know for example um you know like a a new um gmx on um, this new chain you know that type of stuff you know i feel like it's kind of uh, overplayed now right you know i certainly i think there's some some uh, um you know s- some upside there but it's not as groundbreaking as let's say you know investing like the infrastructure of the web3 Vemo. you know we feel like the uh new cycle is going to be very different than the last you know cycles right every time it's very different you know the DeFi happened um, kind of out of nowhere. And then, you know, this, uh, you know, NFT gaming, you know, wave came up also out of uh, out of nowhere. You know, like, for example, we invest in XC Infinity, 
you know, before people really thought NFT is a thing, right? So we also think that this new cycle, it'll be something very, very different. But all of this will need to lead to a future where there will be a lot of consumers using blockchain tech without knowing it's blockchain tech. I think that's how we, you know, kind of try to wrap, wrap our brain around. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the the first wave of, you know, 2016, 17, uh, when that's driven by, largely driven by, you know, uh, fundraising, right? Investing to projects through ICOs. That's that's the big driver and there's maybe like you know 10,000 users you know only 10,000 people participating in these ICOs and that's a very small user base and then the next wave that came with defi you know maybe there's like 50,000 traders defi traders and the user experience is horrible they they look like you know they look like you know curve they look like you know uh uniswap right it's like your grandma can use it that type of thing there's maybe 50,000 you know users and the NFT came, yeah, it's a little bit better. You know, there's some wallets here and there, you know, some open sea, you know, you know, the there's like maybe a hundred thousand users now. It's a wider group. These are still mostly traders, but still not like obvious to like a regular uh, you know, uncle. You know, you don't really just think that he can pick it up. We feel like the next generation of the blockchain tech will need to be something really that simple, like paying money, like how you know, uh two thousand post 1999 crash there's paypal right it's it's just simply fulfilling a demand of paying for something you know something it's, that simple it, it, it's really interesting sir because like what you're saying is actually it sounds like very reasonable from a perspective of user experience and the evolution of like you know what's going to happen but it's also you know i've talked to some other like you know founders many on this like um with Camila Russo we talked also about it like you know but that like that, that's an interesting um contradiction in terms of the ethos because if you think about it like you know what you're essentially referring to is almost like a, a perfect hybrid model right where the user experience is seamless and it'll be so easy to use that you can almost like pay with not only crypto but also with your credit card which requires a basic integration of let's say fiat on ramps right you know which makes it automatically like a hybrid between the CFI and a DeFi worlds, right? You know, and if you talk about the DeFi, pure DeFi product, you still need somewhere to enter, right? You still need to somehow purchase, like, you know, the first asset, the crypto asset, right? And unless you actually provide an opportunity to do it through your phone with, let's say, Apple Pay or, you know, or or whatever the, the other, like, you know, popular, like, you know, uh, providers, that's still almost becoming like, I wouldn't say impossible, but still very convoluted, right? You know, so I'm curious, like, what would be like, what do you see as the first gateway? Let's imagine the design UI UX is solved, right? It's super easy. But what about like, you know, the integration with the other payment providers? Yeah, that I think is a constraint that, you know, may still be there, but you can use MoonPay and all of those on-RAM, off-RAM partners. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about just dealing with crypto itself. That user experience, you know, uh, can be, you know, even more that simple. So yeah. um, you don't have to copy and paste, you know, these super long, you know, digits, you know, wallet addresses, and you don't have to, you know, click here and there, like, you know, go through many, many steps on changing chains and, you know, all of that you know, steps, but make it just that simple, you know, as if, you know, yeah, surely, certainly, you know, uh, let, let's not even forget, let's not even just worry about this onboarding, you know, uh, on ramping from credit card to, you know, crypto. So let's just think, let's just say you have crypto and we want to split money and we want to, you know, divide whatever, but that experience can be that simple, right? You know, let's just get the, get there first. But uh, I would pay it to devil's advocate of people who are like hardcore and decentralized, you know, spectrum, right? What basically is the fear of this community, right? That that would still create a situation where it's it's going to stop being decentralized. So there is like, there's a world that you pay a price for this user experience. You know, I've talked to some of the folks who are like, hardcore, like Bitcoiners, you know, who are like, you know, well, if you want to have your like, custody of your assets well you have to pay the price and i always was like curious well 
Yeah, I'm so, cumber cumbersomeness and uh you know it, it does not equate uh it, it does not it does not mean you're protected. These are very two very different concepts. Like um you can have a smooth user experience while still, you know, have you know um you know while while still you know protect your assets. You know, this does not it, it shouldn't, you know, gate people based on how hard is it to use. You know, if that's the case, then we'll, you know, we should just all go back to use, you know, uh send money through Bitcoin, not even, you know, no no Ethereum, right? No smart contracts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree. With I'm just like always curious to hear like different opinions. Like you know, I'm actually somewhere in between. Also, like I think like the rational way of thinking is that even for the older generation, for like anyone who's coming new to the to the space, it should be super easy. Like nobody has to care. Like you know, like for example, in the United States, as you know, like we have Zelle, right? Zelle is actually blockchain based. No one cares. Nobody knows about it. Actually, I, every time I ask people, do they know? Yeah, that's that's beautiful, right? You know, I just wanna, yeah, I I just don't want to deal with uh, these crypto addresses. I want to send to email. I want to yes. send to your phone number. Yes. You know, I want to you know do my thing, and you know, it's it spends my crypto um, without uh, without having to you know like copy and paste address from some like you know you know some 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 wallet tracker and stuff like that. It's right. that's not user friendly. So, yeah, I mean, it, that creates certain challenges in terms of custody of assets and who's really responsible. But I hear you. I think there should be like, you know, some kind of even opportunity to have a, a very seamless onboarding experience. Right? And we don't have it now. That's completely yeah, true. Whoever can provide that, you know, uh, really pleasant experience while ensuring everything works just awesome, you know, everything's safe and, uh, you know, the hard part is to make it simple. And that's what Apple was able to do. You know, they're able to uh, provide a, a very pleasant user experience and simplified and it's secure at the same time. You don't have to worry about it, you know, and, uh, and, and, and that's, you know, that's also why, you know, the, the most widespread wallet is MetaMask. It's, it's just simple, right? Simple, you know, Although I think this still has stuff that's less than desirable, but it's so simple and it beats all the other wallets, you know, that's out there. There's like, you know, 600 wallets, you know, that's competing. None of them, they, yeah, they may be better in some other ways, you know, here and there, minor differences, but it doesn't have this, that simple aspect. Yeah. And uh, so we need something like we need, something in the payment space we need something in the social space we need some of these basic human needs to be fulfilled you know uh super that simple stuff to be fulfilled in the next generation of web3 tech yeah 100 percent agree i think we need more wallets as well like you know who are the which are oh, no more wallets no. <laughs> no, no no i think again to your point like actually believe that even better than metamask right you know something that will aggregate yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i can give you an sure. example you mentioned about the chain so i'm a big user of metamask i was that like, that's my first wallet and one of the most that i use like you know probably most of the time but the challenge is that there are more exotic chains which you know it doesn't support right because it's a very like i would say evm focus right and then we have new chains that appear let's say solana based you know chains which you 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 you, you require a very different experience and you you just need a different wallet not because you don't want to use metamask it's just because there is no yeah. way to accept other assets like you know on this particular wallet right so so I do believe that the multi multi chain wallets that will solve particular challenge that you're talking about is also going to be the future, and maybe we don't have it them now, like right now. But uh, uh, luckily, you know, like we have time; it's still very early, right? You know, like listen, I mean, now we're talking in 2013, and people say, "Oh, well, it's too late," you know, like to get into. I I actually believe it's not. Like I think it's still super early, like technically. Oh, we're still super early. We're like the same, you know, we're like, you know, at 1999 in terms of tech wise, you know, crashed. And then, you know, before PayPal came along, you know, PayPal was the first real Web2, you know, 
company that got real adoption and they started the rest of this web2 tech scene right you know i think peter Thiel is uh, is very instrumental in uh, in starting this uh, you know sort of this new startup tech startup you know kind of scene and then you know uh, yc you know also really helped propel that yeah. new generation of the system but we don't really have like that paypal type of thing in web3 that really kind of you know just kickstart a you know a general consumer user base you know we're still still stuck at the 100,000 user cutoff right you know but paypal in web2 was able to get 1 million users mm. and they paid for it though they paid 50 bucks per user you know they famously paid 50 bucks per user for it. they burned through all the vc money but i think web3 you they probably don't. don't need to burn that now you know i don't think it's wise to burn that kind of money to get users but there's going to be some payment company that's going to come in and get 1 million users when that happens i think we would be entering in the next phase of you know web3 that's yeah. going to be an inflection and same thing is going to repeat as well there's going to be like a, a yc for web3 that's going to also create a ton of true web3 companies and build a, a new type of that you know web3 tech ecosystem so all that's going to come and we're going to see 20 more years of innovations in this just like how we did you know in web2 right so it's still very very early it's not maybe, it's it's not not late maybe it's going to be beacon why not maybe you're going to be the next yc maybe, yeah i don't know <laughs> who knows it's possible <laughs> Listen, I mean, there's also, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we can talk about the, this part, like, you know, for hours and hours, but I want to say for more episodes, there is one part that, you know, I, I never kind of, um, uh, I never notify some of my guests, like what I'm going to ask at the end. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's beautiful that, you know, it creates a very genuine answer, which has nothing to do with investments. It's more about your life, uh, Kind of paradigm of thinking right you know so my question is like well, what's the meaning of life to you kenzie you know i ponder about that all the time actually doing meditation you know every weekend now to really think about you know um life i think life um you know for me i think it really changes over you know your, your purpose changes you know um uh you know over time right you know when 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 I was younger, I wanted to accomplish certain things, you know, um, you know, and 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 I need to also, you know, in terms of achieving this, you know, um, you know, so certain freedom, you know, and I I think for me the the theme has always been, you know, accomplishing, you know, uh, a freedom in some way, um, so you know, getting to become, you know, um. You know financial freedom that's probably one of the the first you know great uh freedom that one can get and i'm you know blessed to to have you know done that you know quite early on and uh now for me it's more about uh it's more mission driven and right now i think for sandeep and i we really want to um help to give back and also get more people into Web3 because we think it's very, very early still. We are grateful that we have what we have now, you know, and vastly thanks to, you know, Web3. You know, Web3 gave us the liquidity. It gave us the freedom of, you know, being anywhere geographically. It gave us the freedom of um, our career, you know, working remotely. Uh, not being confined in the in office space, and uh, yeah, we're very grateful that we you know did that transition from Web two to Web three, and uh, you know so we want to give back. And Sandeep, you know, you can see what he did recently that he's had, he he launched the the Newell Fellowship because he really came from a super disadvantaged background. We're talking about like um, super poverty, right? You know, he came through that background. And, uh, you know, I'm super impressed by him because, you know, I was previously surrounded by these, you know, 
the typical track of succeeding in Web2, where I was there in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, you know, it, it's typically, oh yeah, go to Stanford, go to MIT, raise some VC money, raise more VC money, and then wait 10 years to become a public company, then cash out, right? That's the t- sort of the, in that tr- kind of track. And uh, and then Sandeep really changed, you know, kind of how all of that, you know, framework, right? He really, you know, proved out in himself by not having gone through that process, came from a, a, a poverty background in India and, uh, and and just keep on building, really believing and being super ambitious and able to launch, you know, a, a protocol and build it to, you know, top 10 now, right? Uh, in, in, in such a short time. And that's fascinating. And uh, he wants to create that opportunity for more people like him globally. And he did that by launching Newell Fellowship uh, recently, which is $50,000 uh, grant for anyone who wants to take a, a leap of faith you know, into Web3. But coming from any kind of background, doesn't matter what background you have, you want to build in Web3, we'll give you 50K. And, uh, and that's one of the ways that he wants to give back to people. Because he also realized that you know, had he been given that opportunity earlier on, he may have quit his previous Web2 work even earlier, you know, um, but he didn't have that, you know, so he was delayed. He wants to reduce that obstacle and onboarding for new people. I don't want to do the same thing. I want to also help bring more Web2 people into Web3. So I, I'm, you know, I'm writing a book right now actually on this. I want to help to um, get people to be in the freedom land mm-hmm. as we're in. I feel like there is a, most people don't know this yet, um, but, you know, this is the future and we're still early. And I want to be a part of that process of evangelizing mm-hmm. people to be the right city the right mindset, the right technology to be free. So um, that's what I'm passionate about at this given time. And what's the topic of the book? The topic of the book is about um, sort of how to become a good Web3 founder. Like yeah. this is the, the the journey that, you know, I've gone through, Sandeep have gone through, and also us interacting with a lot of these Web3 founders. And I really summarize uh, our, um, you know, sort of these things that we talked about earlier on, that great Web3 founders are very different from great Web2 founders. And these are two different sports. So how do you equip yourself to become a better Web3 founder to become more of a free founder. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the topic is, is, is the, you know, it's freedom founder or founder of freedom. How do you become that persona? So, you know, I think for me quite early on, you know, I also read a bunch of web two books and I read, you know, um, Jessica Livingston's, you know, book, which is called founders at work. And mm-hmm. that book talked about how to be a great Web2 founders, right? So, I mean, that's a book with a lot of great Web2 founders, you know, interviews, you know, on like PayPal's early days, you know, and that really got my, you know, you know, this uh, got me intrigued into, you know, joining Web2. And right now there's no such thing in Web3. So I want to create something like that because it also, in a way, demystifies people's understanding, right? Because, like I said, most people still think it's the same sport. People still think sprinting, sprinting, you know, skiing, still sprinting, you know. But it's it's you know it's not it's not a hundred percent accurate. And I I I want to you know help demystify Mm -hmm. that concept and also. Uh, evangelize to get more people to join Web3. 
Got it. That's a very noble endeavor, and I would be happy to support you once you once you kind of publish the book and announce it. Like you know, uh, let me know, and I'll we'll we'll give you a twenty percent discount. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very very <laughs> noble of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, listen, Kenzie, it's it's really interesting to learn from you. Great stories. I'm sure we can talk more. Would be happy to host you more in the show. And you know, thank you so much for sharing uh, what you've shared today. I, th I think you know it's, it's it's already a lot. You know that people can take away from your career, and I think it's kind of very unconventional for like for their like young age that you are still like in your like you know in, in in your prime and you already like achieved so much you know like so the path you went through like you know starting being a, an a entrepreneur and then getting to exchange and get into vc fund and backing like one of the top projects in the industry certainly not a typical path right so it's an inspirational story i really appreciate it i'm sure people who listen to this also uh, will appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, for, for, for the sake, as you mentioned, you know, people can go to your website. We're going to share it in the description, you know, zerox.kenzie.com. And then they can find you with the same, um, with the same extension as on Twitter, zerox.kenzie. Like, you know, where are you more accessible? You want to prefer, you prefer Twitter? I'm mostly accessible, um, Telegram, like all the crypto people are. Telegram, okay. But, you know, Twitter is also fine. I use Twitter. Um, well, it, well, we'll see if you're gonna be if you're gonna be happy if I <laughs> Telegram other because you you might. No, have no, no. no. <laughs> but long story short, I will definitely share again a website. There is a uh, there's an opportunity to apply whether you have an amazing startup to Symbolic Capital or if you're still very early on, you you're let's imagine ideation and like, you know, some scribbles on a napkin, like, and you want to go to the beacon accelerator, you know, I'm sure guys will welcome you and they give you already an amazing playbook, how to pitch, how to make sure you're investable, how to, what are they looking at? And, you know, they're, you're going to be in great, you know, company of amazing founders. So appreciate what you do and appreciate what Sandeep is doing. And yeah, really excited to see the next cohort of amazing Web3 unicorns. Thank you so much, Kenzie. Gracias, Constantine. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Have a good one. Enjoy New York. <laughs> Thank you.